How are you spending your vacation and why? <laughs> <laughs> so... So we hold office hours every day in here, and I have an open door policy in my office. You know, when we're in the district, we set lots of appointments up when I'm actually here for the district office in Mishawaka for not on the road to the other counties. And today, you know, we just have an open door like we have every day to listen to folks um, come in and talk about what they want to talk about. You know, some folks today are coming in and wanting me to know about uh, different things they don't agree with, um, things they do agree with. And some want me to respond, some don't. So I'm literally sitting with a large pad of paper and a pen and just listening to folks. But more importantly, for those that want to have a dialogue and really have a conversation about, um, you know, things, uh, health care, tax reform, um, you know, EPA laws, immigration, all the topics that have come up today, um, I'm thrilled. And I'm thrilled to be able to have the opportunity to sit down and actually talk, listen to folks, but also have... Uh, to have dialogue and, and talk about, um, you know, uh, the perspective of what could be different. And they're letting me know what they want to have that's different. So I think it's incredible. I mean, we've had an incredible time so far today. Why haven't you had a town hall meeting yet? You know, what we've always done is have open doors. I really love the idea of being able to sit down and actually have conversations with folks. Um, to be able to drive down past, um, you know, maybe just one or two issues. But, you know, when you start talking about healthcare, for example, you know, it goes in not just individual stories, but it goes in then to other issues. We start talking about Medicare or you start talking about, you know, growing the economy and, and pro-growth economy and putting people back to work so all ships rise at the same time. And it really does start bridging gaps of information where, um, you know, so I think other environments are, are somewhat difficult, but I treasure the opportunity to do what we're doing today and actually have conversations with folks and looking for solutions. We know from some of the people we've spoken with who are at these meetings today and previously, some of them have organized a town hall on April 9th. I'm sure. sure they told you about sure. it. They say it's going to be moderated. They say they're okay with police coming because obviously there have been a lot of contentious town halls across the country. Knowing that they seem to want to just have a larger discussion that would be safe for you, safe for them, what's resisting you from accepting I, I don't, I, you know, nobody's been talking, we're not talking about, you know, safe and not safe and those kinds of things, but but, um, you know, what to me has been extremely productive is being able to sound and have real conversations. You know, a lot of these issues are not partisan that we're talking about. They never have been. Healthcare and taking care of people in this district, not partisan. You know, taking care of veterans, not partisan. Um, you know, we talked about military budgets today, not partisan. These aren't partisan issues. I just think that, you know, when we're talking about really drilling down and having a chance to hear from people, um, this, this kind of an, uh, of an open door opportunity is incredible. It's incredible for me as well to be able to actually listen, take notes, and, and integrate into the conversation all these different things. So, you know, I mean, it's been, I think it's been phenomenal. Is there a specific reason you won't attend that town hall or another town hall that may be set up? Is there a specific reason you holding know, you back? No, there really isn't. I, you know, other than the open dialogue that we've had has been very productive. And I think that, um, we're, you know, we're going to continue with an open door. We'll continue having, you know, is, uh, lots of different meetings and lots of different folks in here. Um, but I think it's really important to have the time to drill down with folks and honestly hear them. And, and, and with no pressure on them either to, uh, to have honest conversations about things that are of um, you know value to them and, and to their neighbors and to their extended family and those kinds of things. A lot of issues come up when you have a chance to actually have real dialogue. Repeal and replace. Yeah, so replace. fluid as we speak. We're working on it over the weekend. We have had conference calls all weekend and I would tell you that the, uh, the bill is moving quickly and um, gonna be out very soon. And just as, you know, kind of a just refresher for, for everybody, when this bill actually comes out, which, you know, it's going to, um, this is a starting place, not a finishing place. You know, you start a legislative process once the bill comes out, and then it's basically open to every American through the hearing process, through the vetting process of information. And that's how bills become better. You know, you know, we're seeking bipartisan support. There's going to be a hefty amendment process as the months roll on here, the weeks, you know, whatever it turns out to be. But that's exactly what the process is. And, and I think this will be a good, healthy process. A lot of folks are going to have opinions about it. We're going to hear, I think, things that make it even better than, you know, as it will roll out. But I also think people are going to be very surprised and very relieved that this bill is, uh, this is not a punitive bill, this is not a partisan bill, this is a bill that actually brings um, a net around the vulnerable folks in this country. Obamacare, affordable care, um, whatever you call it, however folks refer to it, this is, um, it's a failing program that's falling under its own weight right now. If we don't come in in a sense of urgency as we are right now and bring that net 
under vulnerable people, they will lose their health care. Under our plan, they will not lose their health care. And, you know, there's a lot of a lot of thought that's gone into this. You know, the, the precursors back in the day, even probably 18 months ago, that really sat around the table on the House side were the doctors and physicians that serve in Congress and a lot of those shareholders around the table. So this wasn't a backdoor, um, you know, closed door. This was a very open process. Um, we put it in our blueprint a year and a half ago, and a lot of this was already voted on in 2015. So I think Americans are going to be pleasantly surprised, and I hope this eases a lot of the fears that folks have with the miscommunication that's been out there saying, you know, oh, you're not going to, we're not going to cover these people, and these people are going to go here. We're going to cover those people, and we're going to do a better job at it, giving our governors and our states a lot more flexibility with how they cover folks in their states. And, and the money will be there as well. And I think that's one of the issues that, you know, we had a chance to kind of, you know, talk through this morning with a lot of these folks that are in here. There's been so much miscommunication about this being um, partisan, and it's just absolutely not partisan. This is actually, you know, what a lot of folks in our district have asked for. And, you know, for every, you know, person that comes in here and says, well, I don't like it and I'm against what you're doing, that's fine, right? This is the American way. This is an open dialogue about this plan. But I can also tell you, as a member, as, you know, uh, a member of the House representing the 2nd District, um, the, the amount of phone calls that we got from folks that were vulnerable in the plan, a lot of single moms with kids, you know, the deductibles went up where they couldn't pay for them and, uh, seven to ten thousand dollars, five to ten thousand dollars. That means that single mom with with their kids were just going to have to pay for a cash health care plan. That's what was happening under the plan that they were covered by. So you know, my concern is for those folks at Well, keeping a very balanced approach and making sure we deliver health care that it's safe, it's effective, and obviously covers more pe- more people. And then you know, and the other issue with this is we're doing it hand in hand with tax reform. You know, we we are going into a very fast pro growth, pro jobs part of this. Country country with tax reform, with the idea being in mind, you know, that all ships rise when we talk about bringing rates lower, employing more people, and having better jobs, all ships rise in our country, and that's the goal. At this what? point, those are key concepts as far as what the health care is going to look like. You know, I think that, um, you know, what you're going to see is flexibility with the governors. The governors were all in D.C. last weekend. And, you know, cumulatively, you know, they sent some of the issues that are important to them that were literally just being addressed last week. And I think one of the things that is going to be important here in Indiana is, you know, uh, Governor Holcomb, brand new governor, legislature in session right now. And, you know, they're going to be looking at things like, you know, is it going to be, um, you know, will the Medicaid expansion look anything like what it does now? Will they be able to choose a community block grant? Will they, able to, will they be able to look at a hybrid model maybe with some per capita and some uh, community block grant? You know, those are the kind of things that are going to come out where you're going to see a lot more state flexibility. Instead of a one system fits all, which we just came from with the Affordable Care Act, which obviously hasn't serviced everybody well. There's been a lot of losers in that, and that's what, and we've heard from you know, both winners and losers. But I think what you're going to see is patient-centered, doctor-centered health care and much less role from the federal government, which is what folks were clamoring for in the majority of calls that we got in our district. What do you make about President Trump's tweets over the weekend claiming President Obama had tapped Trump Tower during the election? Um, I'm obviously not the president, and I don't work for the president. You know, I'm a separate legislative branch of government that makes sure that we listen to people and we find balances and solutions in our country, and that's exactly what we're doing. I think that, uh, you know, obviously the president has his own opinion, his own mind, and he says what's on his mind. But I think that, uh, you know, just as there's investigations rolling today through the intel community on the role of Russia and some of these other things that have come up that, you know, folks are talking about, you know, I think that there's probably, you know, if he's calling for an investigation, that I'm sure there'll be an investigation. But I think it's really important for the Congress and members like me to stay completely focused on what we're doing this week and next week, which is making sure that we get this right with health care, making sure we get this right with tax reform, and that we get the American people back to work and we see the consumer confidence that has been risen in the last couple of months, our job is to make sure that we come through with what we've promised the American people. I'm not obviously responsible for the President of the United States, but I am responsible to deliver to this district, which is exactly why we're doing what we're doing today. Does it concern you at all that the President makes these blanket statements without any evidence? You know, you know, the president's going to do what the president's going to do. Every president has had, you know, the the freedom to do what they want to do. They're duly elected, and they're the, you know, the commander in chief, the leader of the free world. And I think that, you know, it's the American people to stand in judgment of him. My uh, title is as representative is to fight for the people in this district and to make sure that we deliver to them. 
you know, better jobs, an increase of jobs, a tax reform system that works for them and not against them, and making sure that, um, you know, that we take care of the vulnerable people in this country, which is what we're certainly focusing on right now. In addition to, I would tell you this, um, because this has come right down the path this week as well, is making sure that we put the additional resources in the United States military that we need. And, you know, I served on uh, Armed Services Committee for four years, and, uh, you know, the, our military was woefully whittled through by the Obama administration down to the smallest it's been since World War II. And, you know, we, we are in danger of literally being not ready. The readiness in our military across the board has been completely affected in a very, very negative way. So you're going to start seeing us supporting increases in budgets as they start coming through to actually completely fund the military. And, you know, it needs to be done. The national security of this country is on the minds of every American. And we deserve to send our finest out there that are absolutely covered and prepared for victory. And tax credits are probably looking at a, a system based on... That's still in flux. Those conversations are still going on. But, you know, uh, tax credits, tax deductions and those kinds of things have been talked about. But, uh, you know, they're going to be they're going to continue the, the conversation when we're going to have conversations this afternoon, even before, um, you know, the, we actually get the bill ready to roll out. So flexibility and Perfect. Effect, I guess. Yeah, Excellent. absolutely. Thank yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks Appreciate for coming. You.